So I'm talking today about multi-species uh, swords and their performance. And I guess our work in this area started back in about 2012. Um, and our interest in it is really around um, enhancing the ecological processes that the natural ecological processes that will allow us to, I suppose, um, reduce our reliance on, on nutrient inputs. So uh, uh, in terms of um, where we, we know we have to get to, if we look at the farm to fork strategy, we know that there's a requirement that we reduce our uh, reliance on fertilizers by 20% by 2030. But we also have other commitments under the uh, Water Framework Directive and the recent EPA report, for example, which show that we still have a very significant body of work in order to get all our uh, water courses to, to good ecological status um, before 2027. Um, in terms of multi-species grasslands, I guess what I'm referring to here are grasslands that may help uh, be part of the toolbox of trying to address these challenges that will lie ahead of us uh, and that we're currently trying to grasp with. Um, we're talking about swords here that have a, a relatively low number of species within them, a handful, you know, somewhere between six and 12 species, for example, uh, that have been carefully chosen for their potential productivity. And I guess the premise is that when you grow these together, that they'll be able to utilize resources in a more effective and efficient way than perhaps uh, just growing a monoculture. And of course, that happening above ground, but also recognizing that it will happen below ground as well in response to different rooting strategies and depths, et cetera, of the, the different species that are included within those swords. So I suppose our, our first project in this area was Smartgrass, a, a project that was funded by the Department of Agriculture. And this is our starting point. Um, we wanted to identify whether there was potential there in terms of multi-species swords grown under reduced N inputs uh, in terms of providing a, a potentially viable alternative to high input ryegrass monocultures. Um, we certainly weren't expecting necessarily that any of, of the multi-species swords would, would perform uh, or outperform the ryegrass, but it was just to see if we could find a, a viable alternative. And to do that, we established a plot experiment back in 2013, where we had 112 plots consisting of one to nine species, and those were taken from three functional groups, plant functional groups, so including grasses, legumes, and forage herbs within them. And we included those different species from the different functional groups in different proportions in the, in the different mixtures. And we tested those across different nitrogen input levels, so ranging from zero to 135 kgn per hectare per year. And we had a conventional control of perennial ryegrass receiving 250 kgn. So we harvested those eight times over the growing season and took, monitored everything I suppose that we could in terms of the, the plant growth over that time period, but took samples for dry matter production, but also to look at the composition uh, of that, that dry matter production as well. So in terms of the results from that work, um, this graph here shows that um, uh, the, the, the dot, it's along our x-axis um, that we have the, an, an increasing nitrogen rate. So uh, we're working from zero to 135 kgn, and we're looking at the response of different uh, sword types in, uh, in response to that um, increase in N. And on the y-axis, you can see the kilograms dry matter per hectare produced from those different sword types. The different colors of the lines are representing the different mixtures we included in this experiment. So um, they're always presented in terms of the proportion of grasses, legumes, and herbs included in the initial mixture that was sown. So for example, um, you have one there, the green one is 100% grass with no legumes or herbs in it, while the orange one is 55% grass, 35% legume and 10% herb. 
So you can see the dotted black line there, and that's the uh, yield from the perennial ryegrass receiving 250 kgn. And you can see from this that many of our multi-species mixes actually performed re really well by comparison, even receiving zero nitrogen input. But when we move to 45 kg, uh, and we start to see some of them outperforming the, the perennial ryegrass receiving the high end input. Now that line at the top represents a mix that included 60% legume and that blue line, so hence the performance there. If we look at this uh, throughout different the, the different parts of the growing season, so uh, from spring, the herbage production, um, we can see again that many of the multi-species mixes are performing reasonably really well, even at uh, zero N input. Um, in summer, the ryegrass really came into its own. Um, however, we still did have that 55, 35, 10 mix that was out yielding it. Uh, and over the autumn, we see again that while the ryegrass, the growth, uh, the herbage production dropped back, a number of our mixtures were performing really well into the autumn. Just in terms of the composition of that yield, uh, and we, we divided up our samples into the different component species. So if we look at composition um, in response to nitrogen input levels, that top line there is a, a score that was sown with 60% legume and the remainder was grass. And in response to that, we see that at zero N we get 28% of our dry matter is coming from grass and 70 from legumes. While at 135 kgn, we're getting 45% of our yield from grass and 52 from legumes. Now, there's no yield change though. There's no difference in how much is being produced. So really all we're doing by adding in that nitrogen is just changing the composition of the dry matter, but we're not actually uh, increasing the yield. And similarly, we find that to a greater or lesser extent with some of the other mixtures, we were promoting the, the grass component by increasing the, the nitrogen input but, and, and reducing the legume content. Um, and in some cases we get a yield response, yes, but I guess it's up to individual farmers whether they need that yield response. And I guess what this does is, is maybe provide people with options uh, so they can decide what they're going to put in. Um, in terms of weeds, and I know it's always a concern because you can't use a post-emergence uh, spray on these swords. What I can report from our work, um, and this is at one site, so that has to be taken into account, but we had very low uh, weed occurrence within our swords here. Um, the biggest issue we had was legumes jumping into our monocultures, and that's represented by the green line that you're seeing on that graph there, although that was decreasing in response to nitrogen input. I guess uh, another concern people have is around the persistence of these species or questions that we often get is around the persistence of the species. And really that's going to change depending on the species you're talking about, but also whether it's cut or whether it's grazed. And this is work that we were showing from um, Coxfoot under simulated grazing conditions or cutting conditions versus grazing conditions. And you can see a decrease in yield under our decrease in persistence under uh, grazing. Um, similarly with Timothy, um, and we're also showing the Ribworth plantain, how that's performing versus chicory. I guess while we look at those and say, okay, the persist, they're decreasing in persistence or abundance over time, and that's true, we have to remember that we were managing these swords as ryegrass mono, uh, as ryegrass swords, so we were cutting them or grazing them on the same sort of rotation as you would a ryegrass sword, but also to the same sort of post grazing sword height. And I think what we've learned from this is that ryegrass management does not suit these kind of mixes. We need to adapt our management to be able, for these species to be able to persist.
Um, in addition, we did some work on these plots on earthworms, and I just want to provide you with a very quick overview of the impacts on earthworm biomass and abundance. And we can see here that certainly the legume inclusion in swords is really driving a very, uh, a very significant um, growth in both legume biomass and also abundance. And I, I'm talking to my colleague, Professor Olaf Schmidt, he would say this is a, a kind of a recognized relationship, but really important that we acknowledge it, that legumes within swords are going to enhance that um, earthworm component of the sword. Um, other additional work on a subset of plots that we undertook was to look at uh, surface casts, earthworm surface casts, as an indicator of earthworm activity within the swards. And again, we can see here that it was lowest under our ryegrass sward. So all of the sward types that had uh, legumes within them um, had a greater level of earthworm activity as indicated by the earthworm cast. And also measuring water infiltration rates, we found a similar relationship and when you look at the two together, you find that that relationship is very significant and very positive. So that led us on to the establishment of the UCD Lions long-term grazing platform. And I guess that has come about certainly down to the, it's uh, certainly uh, down to the vision and the foresight of our head of school, Professor Alex Evans, to, uh, uh, to lead to the establishment of this. Uh, platform that will allow us to look at a whole range of components of sustainability of ruminant production systems um, over time. And the initial project that we have running on that is Smart Sword, which is our follow on project from Smart Grass. And again, that's funded by the Department of Agriculture. What we have within the platform is a, a three experimental farmlets established in 2019, and each of those is eight hectares in size. So we have a perennial ryegrass um, monoculture, and that's receiving just over 200 kgn per hectare per year. Ryegrass and white clover, and a multi-species mix then, so a six species mix, uh, and that and the uh, ryegrass and white clover are receiving 90 kgn. It's stocked at a stocking rate of 2.5 livestock units per hectare. And Tommy will be talking to you about animal performance results from that in a few moments. But just to look very quickly at the, the sward performance, and we're always careful about you know, data from just one year, but this is the, the, the yield and kilograms of dry matter per hectare from the three sward types over 2020. Um, and, and I guess you can see from this that there's not much of a difference in terms of yield from that last year. However, that yield of the ryegrass and ryegrass, sorry, the uh, ryegrass and white clover multi-species mixes, it has to be remembered, is coming from swards that are receiving less than half the amount of nitrogen that the ryegrass swards are receiving. Another project that we're involved in and working with our colleagues in Devonish and Wageningen and on is Heartland. And uh, here we have four sward types where we're looking at ryegrass permanent pasture, a six species mix, and also a 12 species mix. And in that instance, these swords are being co-grazed co by cattle and sheep. I'll just give an insight again, that was established in 2019. And this, you know, it allows us to see how these swords perform under real grazing conditions. And just to, to show the yields from those sword, sword types, during 2020, again, you know, with the proviso that this is only one year's data, but we can see how our six and our 12 species mixes are performing really well uh, under much reduced nitrogen input conditions. Um, the last slide I want to show here is one that just highlights the, the change in growth rates uh, from the different sward types at, at Dalton. What I have highlighted here in the gray box represents the time period during the drought last year. I think it's really interesting to see how the different swords performed during that period. Um, so the green line represents our six species mix, 
while the tw uh, 12 species mix is represented by the yellow line. And yes, you see a decrease in yield or, or growth rates rather over that time period of the drought, but it's not as much of a decrease as we're seeing in either the ryegrass or the permanent pasture. Okay, so I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Professor Tommy Boland, and he'll talk about the animal performance and the things. Thanks very much, Helen. So just while you're uh, getting set up there, Tommy, just want to say a special welcome to our viewers in uh, Germany and the UK and across Europe. And I see we have some viewers dialing in from the US as well. So you're all very, very welcome. So Tommy, we'll hand over to you. Thanks, Mark. And I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate yourself and Pat and the team in Chavez on the one year anniversary of the signpost series. Um, and it's extra pressure on me now to mark the one year anniversary, I suppose. But before I kick off, I'd also like to congratulate my, our, acknowledge my collaborators on this work. And as Helen has already done, acknowledge the funders, uh, which are many at this stage. So my focus is going to be on the impact of multi-species swords on animal performance. Um, but just a few things to kind of set the scene from my perspective. Uh, multi-species sward is a broad term used to describe swards containing a, a range of different plant species. And we're currently using it as kind of a catch-all, but you know, there are a lot of different types of multi-species swards available on the market. They're also referred to as herbalays. Um, they're not to be confused with species-rich grasslands uh, as multi-species swards are, are sown uh, renovated uh, swards, whereas the species-rich grasslands are more traditional uh, swards which have developed over decades. Uh, you might be familiar with, with, with them as legume herb swards in New Zealand, but they're not exactly the same as the multi-species swards we have in Ireland. And multi-species swards, they're dynamic between and within years. So I'm just showing you a series of different pictures <coughs> of multi-species swards, and visually they look quite different, uh, even though they contain the same, in some instances, the same species, just at different ratios. And these final two pictures are of a multi-species sward we established in lines um, last August. So this was the picture of that sward in September, where it pretty much looks to be dominated by chicory. And this is the same sward yesterday when yews and lambs are turned out to graze that, and it's, it's dominated by grass and by plantain. So it's just, it's important to understand that we're talking about a fairly dynamic uh, sward, much more dynamic than a perennial ryegrass pasture or even a perennial ryegrass white clover pasture. My presentation is going to focus on Irish data because I, I do feel it's very important to test um, these scenarios in an Irish context. And I will focus on animal performance to date, growth and yield um, data from our animal studies. Uh, we are looking at environmental impacts such as nitrogen excretion and methane emissions. And in some cases work is planned and other cases that work is ongoing. And I also would like to acknowledge the significant workload that's, that's undertaken in Chagas at the moment um, on, on beef sheep and dairy systems, uh, and the results of that work are, are really, um, I suppose, looked forward to on my behalf. So just to build on what Helen has said, if I go back and look at the animal grazing part of the Smart Grass, grass Project, we had a sheep study uh, in that particular project, and we tested four different swards under sheep grazing. Um, we had a perennial ryegrass sward uh, receiving a relatively high level of fertilizer nitrogen. <clears throat> And for the rest of my presentation, the ryegrass sward would be uh, indicated by the red bars. We had a ryegrass and white clover sward, blue, uh, a six species sward containing two grasses, two legumes and two herbs, which be indicated by the green bars. And then we had a nine species mixture containing three grasses, three legumes and three herbs, indicated by the yellow bars. And all those mixtures were fertilized with 90 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year. And these Farmlets or these farms are stocked at a relatively high stocking rate of 12 and a half yews per hectare, and each yew was rearing two lambs. And this work formed part of Connie Grace's uh, PhD thesis. And the next few slides I'm going to present are all going to follow this same uh, layout. Uh, the columns in the background are the data, and the, the box up the front that, that looked that basically represents the message I want to deliver based on each slide. So when we looked at the impact of these different sward types on the average daily gain <clears throat> of lambs from birth to six weeks of age, uh, we saw that compared to a perennial ryegrass sward, lambs suckling yews, which grazed the six species sward, had an 18% higher growth rate to six weeks of age. And in sheep production systems, lamb performance up to six weeks of age 
is essentially a reflection of the milk production capacity of the ewe. So the ewes uh, grazing the multi-species forts had a higher either volume or quality of milk produced to support the growth rate of their lambs. And when we move on to look at the impacts in that same study of lamb performance up to weaning, uh, we can see that compared to a perennial ryegrass sward, lamb suckling ewes, uh, which grazed the six species sward, had a 2.4 kilo higher live weight at weaning. And to put some further context on these results, the, the orange line across the middle of the slide here, that represents our target weaning weight for twin bearing lambs at 30 weeks of age. So all our treatments outperformed our target. And perhaps most interestingly of all in this particular metric, anytime we made the sward more complex than simply perennial ryegrass, we did see an animal performance boost in terms of increased weaning weight uh, at 14 weeks of age. Unsurprisingly then, these animals which had the higher weaning weight, they reached slaughter at an earlier age. Um, so compared to a perennial ryegrass sward, lambs fed any mixed sward reached slaughter approximately two weeks earlier. And this can have important knock-on effects on, on any farm. On a sheep farm, it will free up um, herbage uh, for the yo coming into the mating period. And if we look back to some of the earlier work done with beef cattle, reducing the age at slaughter uh, has positive impacts in terms of the carbon footprint per, per kilo of meat produced. So there's a potentially a second win here, which we're currently modeling at the moment. And it's important again to realize that these animal performance benefits, <coughs> they, they were achieved um, from systems which are fertilized with 45% less fertilizer than nitrogen. And essentially compared to perennial ryegrass swords, multi-species swords uh, produce the same quantity of herbage um, with 45% less fertilizer nitrogen application. So the animal performance ben benefits weren't being achieved as a result of concentrate supplementation or some other type of supplement being brought into the system. So they're really interesting results in terms of animal performance. I think that, that for me, the next set of slides I'm going to present are perhaps the most important uh, from that sheep study. And it looks at the effect of sward type on the requirement for anti treatments in our sheep production systems. And it's, it's perhaps one of the greatest challenges facing pasture-based sheep production systems is the developing resistance that, that antihelminthic drugs are the drugs we use to control uh, roundworms and stomach worms in our sheep. So with our multi-species swords, uh, the interval from one dosing to the next was longer for lambs grazing multi-species swords. So essentially what we were doing in this study, we were measuring the fecal egg count as the crude indication of parasite burden of our animals every two weeks. And when they hit a threshold, they were drenched on a treatment basis. So what we saw with our perennial ryegrass animals is that they were being dosed every four to five weeks. Uh, that was extended by a week up to about six weeks for animals grazing the multi-species or grazing the ryegrass white clover sward, and then up to, to seven to eight weeks for the animals grazing the multi-species swords. And that meant over the lifetime of those animals uh, that they, the animals grazing the multi-species swords required about 50% fewer drench administrations compared to the animals grazing the perennial ryegrass only sward. So despite my bias the, 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 uh, for sheep, uh, the, the real, I suppose, potential for these swords at a national level are in our cattle systems. And Helen has already described the smart sward program we're involved in, which is focused on, on beef cattle. We've just completed our, in 2020 was the first full year of grazing on that, on that platform. Um, and Helen has described the, the different treatments, our ryegrass, our ryegrass white clover, and our multi-species wards. So these data are at an early stage of um, analysis. But Fanula Godwin, who's the PhD student running this program, she has um, some, some data available uh, looking at the impact of sward type on the average daily gain of Hereford steers from the dairy herd during their second year at pasture. Um, and compared to animals grazing perennial ryegrass only swards, Animals which grazed either a multi-species sward or the perennial ryegrass white clover sward had a 20% higher growth rate uh, during their second year of grass, um, and which ultimately resulted in the animals grazing those swards being slaughtered at a younger age. And again, that data is currently being analyzed by Fanula 
And then to move on into the, the work with our colleagues in Devonish as part of the, the Marie Curie funded Heartland project. And in this study, um, we had a, a four sword treatments and these were grazed by cattle and sheep together. So they were grazed by heifers from, from, from beef heifers and by yews and lambs in a co-grazing scenario. And again, I suppose really promisingly from our perspective, the, the data or results we produced at Lyons were, were mirrored or reflected in the data we've produced in, in doubt uh, to date. Uh, granted, it's only one year of data, but uh, Gaspar Bocarne is the PhD student working there. And his work would show that lambs grazing multi-species swords had a 24% higher average daily gain than animals grazing either a perennial ryegrass pasture or an old permanent pasture from turnout to slaughter. And the net result of that was that in this particular study, the animals grazing the multi-species forms were slaughtered approximately a month earlier on average than their counterparts grazing the perennial ryegrass and the old permanent pasture swords. Then to look at the performance of the heifers involved in that co-grazing study, <clears throat> again, we're seeing a positive benefit in terms of animal performance from the animals grazing the six species, multi-species sward. Uh, and beef heifers grazing the six species mix had a 13% higher average daily gain than animals grazing the perennial ryegrass and the permanent pasture during their second summer grass. And this is something we've seen now in, 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 a, in a number of studies that the six species mixture seems to be the best performing mixture of the mixtures we have tested. And at least in the limited range of studies we have conducted, increasing the number of species to a nine or a 12 species mixture hasn't impacted uh, on animal performance over and above what we're achieving at the six species mixture level. And the final piece of work I want to speak about is some work being conducted by Kate McCarthy in Lyons. Uh, Kate is another one of our PhD students working on the Smart Sword project. Uh, and Kate has conducted a zero grazing study with dairy cows uh, in, in 2020. And it was zero graze for logistical reasons rather than, than we necessarily wanted to test the the swords under a zero grazing scenario. And again, we had our perennial ryegrass monoculture at a high level of fertilizer nitrogen, our ryegrass white clover at 90 kilos and our multi-species sward at 90 kilos. And to, to finish up, I'm just gonna present three slides of results from this piece of work. Um, firstly, we looked at, at sward dry matter intake or forage dry matter intake um, and the mid lactation, this was offered to mid lactation dairy cows in UCD Lions Farm. Um, the animals grazing either the perennial ryegrass white clover or the multi-species sward uh, had a higher forage dry matter intake compared to the animals grazing the perennial ryegrass only sward. When we look then at the effect of these swards on milk yield, um, the animals grazing the multi-species sward had a higher energy corrected milk yield compared to animals grazing either the multi or either the perennial ryegrass sward or the perennial ryegrass and white clover sward. And then when we looked at the milk solid yield or the, the kilograms of fat and protein produced per cow per day, again, we were seeing that the mid lactation dairy cows offered zero grazed um, forage had higher fat and protein yields when they were offered a multi-species sward. So we've seen consistent animal performance benefits from, from grazing these multi-species swards over the duration of the studies which we have conducted. So I think just to, to sum up, and Helen has, has laid it out very well at the beginning of her presentation, <clears throat> Irish and global agriculture is faced with several challenges. And offering animal swords consisting of more than a single species improves animal performance. And I'm quite confident to say that now. Um, I think what we need to, to do um, before we have wider rollout of multi-species swords is to, to come up with the systems that allow us to establish, manage, and ensure the persistence under grazing of these multi-species swords. And, and you know, there is a body of work to be conducted in that. We need to measure the direct environmental impacts of these swords under Irish conditions, but certainly a lot of the early indications and a lot of the logical thinking would suggest that there should be environmental benefits as well from an emissions perspective. And Helen has already listed some of the benefits from, a, from an invertebrate airborne population perspective. And I think it's also important to say that multi-species swords, they're, they're not a silver bullet solution, but they, I believe they will form part of an array of solutions uh, available to farmers into the future. So I'll finish up there, Mark, and if there's any questions, uh, we'll, we'll try to deal with them. <laughs>
Thanks very much, Tommy. Uh, that was excellent and really complimented uh, John Finn's presentation from, from a number of weeks ago. So thank you for that. And uh, Helen, we can invite you to, to join us again and uh, if you can do so. Um, and uh, we have uh, lots and lots of questions coming through here. So gener generated a lot of interest and, and the same, same also with John's presentation a few weeks ago. Um, I suppose a few questions coming through there around the whole persistence of these uh, swords and, you know, the level of work that's involved in, in maintaining them compared to your traditional perennial, perennial ryegrass sword. Um, Helen, you were talking about, you mentioned persistence in your, your presentation. I mean, what, what have your findings been on that? Yeah, Mark, um, I showed some of the, I suppose, persistent, the graphs of persistence of some of the species there within the presentation. Um, I suppose we, what we do know about persistence is that they're not going to persist particularly well, certainly if they're managed as a ryegrass sword. Mm. That's not the management that is going to benefit these swords and help them to continue uh, into the future. So we've got to tailor that management. Um, and I guess what we're trying to do current, within our current projects with our collaborators is to learn uh, what management is required to enhance persistence. So some of the things we're looking at are, you know, varying the post grazing sword height from your kind of traditional approach of four centimeters with a, a ryegrass sword, for example, up to six centimetres to try and benefit the herb component within the multi-species sword. Um, also increasing the duration of the, the, the length of the rotation in them to allow the herbs to recover between the, the various rotations, you know. So we're learning that process. We are collecting data on it to see how the how the different species respond in, in response to changing these these variables. Um, but I guess when we put all that together, we hope that we'll we'll have some more definitive uh, answers on on how best to manage them for for persistence. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Tommy, if I could turn to you, uh, last uh, the last time we were talking to John uh, Finn, he was encouraging farmers to to maybe experiment with this. That you know, whilst the, the research is still ongoing, uh, that there there is a lot of con conclusive uh, outcomes from the research, and that it you know it is ready for trialing in in a, a real environment. Would you uh, agree with that? Yeah, well, I, I think, Mark, you know, when, as I said, when we get these swords established um, and we have multi-species swords available to our animals and the animals graze them, their performance is improved. And that's that's clear across dairy, beef, beef and sheep co-grazing systems and, and sheep only systems now at this stage. And I think when if farmers are looking at putting in these um, into their into their farms, into their into their system, it does it does need a little bit of thought and a little bit of consideration. And, and I wouldn't be a huge fan of just, you know, throwing in a paddock into the general rotation and cows hit that once every 21 days or the cattle come into it once every every couple of months i think if we where and there's various reasons for that because they're not going to be managed optimally in that scenario because you'd be in the ryegrass management mindset and you're going to chuck your cows into your into your multi-species ward and graze it as ryegrass and we know it, it won't persist under that scenario you know what i would like to see is, is setting up enough of the land area that you can have a rotation running through um, your, your multi-species ward, so if that's 10-15% of the land area is dedicated to them, and for example on a, on a dairy farm you might put your replacement calves into that and rotate them around through it for the year where the animals can adapt to the multi-species ward and that they're not coming in and coming out of it, so that there's a property stock class given access to that. The, the, the fear I would have or the concern is maybe if we just say okay throw them in and they don't get the optimal management and they fail it's it's a failure of the of the of the sword rather than some other problem in the management of the sword certainly get them out on the farm but not just give it some consideration how they're introduced into the rotations yeah no i think that's really really good advice and that you can understand that you know that that uh, 
uh, one grazing in, in, in 21 is, is or, or 21 days is, is, is probably more of a shock to the system, all right, sir, uh, than, than actual gradually introducing or maintaining it with the diet. Uh, Pat, uh, some really uh, good yeah, questions hello. coming in, building on, on, on that uh, last presentation. We, we thought we had exhausted all the questions with John Finn, but oh, no. a huge, huge interest. Yeah, I think a huge interest across a, a range of, of, of topics. One that's come true is the um, performance in the early season. And uh, um, Helen, you had a, a graph there. I think it was just a one case where I think it showed that the 12 species was performing in that early season, uh, the same as, as, as perennial ryegrass, but there might have been a little bit of a dip in the, the six species. Just, I suppose, I, the, the question is, what is the level of performance that you've seen in that, I suppose, critical early season uh, period? Well, um, just to go back to that, I guess it's going to come down very much to, to soil temperature is going to have a, a critical impact on that and, and getting the legumes to, to, to do their work within that time period. Um, certainly I'm just bringing up. So in spring, um, the work that we had done had shown that we were getting about three tons of dry matter coming from the, the perennial ryegrass um, at the 250 kgn, um, but we were getting um, between three and a half and four tons on some of our other mixes. So it doesn't seem to be a problem there. Um, As I say, it will, soil temperature will, will have an impact there in terms of the legume performance, you know, and making sure that that they can drive the system because you're you're depending very much on them. But we're we're front loading our nitrogen applications onto those swords as well, um, so getting it out early. A uh, couple of questions in relation to uh, potential reseeding and the, and the prospect of of not having to to plow to, uh, uh, in terms of of maintaining carbon in the in the soil. How does that work relative, say, to, to uh, uh, perennial ryegrass? Okay, so uh, it's certainly something we're very conscious of and, and we want to know more about. So at plot level with our partners in Devonish, we're looking at a conventional kind of plow till sow versus direct drill of seed into the sward. And I think I can say at this stage that there doesn't appear to be a difference in terms of establishment. And, and subsequent performance from the very early data we have from that. Okay. Um, Question then, sorry, in relation to uh, baseline soil fertility, are you seeing uh, a, a kind of a high requirement to, to get your soil fertility right? Or does it, uh, if you have mixed soil fertilities on the farm, is it going, are you going to get persistence? I guess um, what we see is if, if it's more about the, the soil health overall, I think, and, and pH included within that. And um, certainly, you know, if you've got poor soil fertility, background fertility, that would, on which a uh, uh, poor soil health, I suppose, in the background, uh, where a ryegrass monoculture won't grow well, then your multi-species mix won't necessarily perform fantastically either. So we need to get broader soil health, uh, you know, sorted out in order for these to perform well. Um, and also, of course, pH is, is hugely important with the legumes in that. I think, Paddy, if, oh, yeah. if we could just jump in there as well. I think in any sward rejuvenation program, reseeding is nearly the last step on the stairs. You need to get your soil fertility right, your soil pH, your P and K indexes, your grazing infrastructure, your management systems in place first. If you put the cart before the horse with receding first of all and hoping all those other things will come afterwards, I think it can often be a, a poor use of resources. And to go back to the direct drilling question, in the in the um, smart grass project and the results are presented of Connie Grace's PhD thesis, those swords were direct drilled in that particular study. Okay. There's a question there in, in relation to, or two questions, one in relation to, I suppose, heavy soils uh, and as a, a specific piece on that in relation to potential for poaching, is it increased or decreased? And then there's a, a question in relation to its relevance on, on peaty soils. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not sure that we should be putting them in on peaty soils, um, but uh, heavy soils, I guess we just, 
you mean you have to you have to be careful of them you have to ensure that you know you're not going to damage them but what i draw your attention to is that earlier slide i showed on water infiltration rates as well that we seem to be getting enhanced um, earthworm populations under these sword types and also as a consequence of that the enhanced infiltration rates within these so in fact the whole thing could actually assist in 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 allowing a longer grazing period potentially uh, over to, uh, time you know once you you get a few years of those sword types in on, the, on those kind of soils yeah, and that that addresses another question that was there in relation to infiltration and, and the possibility that it might help uh, reduce overland flow if you get better drainage. Uh, I think you've kind of answered that, have you? I don't think it'll happen overnight, Pat. Yeah. You know, it's going to take a while to, for that to build up, but I think there's potential there. Yeah. yeah, and another question in relation to water quality relates to, uh, I suppose, the, the end leaching and uh, uh, the possibility for, I suppose, uh, particularly autumn, uh, high levels of N arising from clover in particular in the autumn. Is that a concern or uh, is it more than counteracted by, I suppose, the, the general uh, reduction in, in nitrogen levels or is there any work going on in that space? I, I suppose the, the, the honest answer to that question, we don't know at this stage, but we are we are collecting the data on on that smart sword platform that, that Helen has, has has outlined. We do have the capacity to, to measure the nutrient loss in the water, um, and our colleague Paul Murphy is very much centrally involved in that in that program. But yeah, it's it, with with legume rich swords, you do have that risk in the autumn and over winter of the of the breakdown of the legume and the release of of nitrogen in the system. We have a few questions coming in in relation to the insilability of these swords um, and, uh, you know, how successful has that been and are, are there, is there additional wilting required or additional management uh, around uh, silage uh, cutting time? Um, maybe I'll jump in there. Um, first, Helen. And, um, so based on Tom, Thomas Maloney's work um, with Range, certainly would have found that you can make as good a quality silage uh, from the multi-species as a, a good ryegrass silage. However, uh, only if conditions, weather conditions are, are good and if there's enough wilting going on. And certainly that would reflect our own experience, I think, out on the platform as well. So if you've got poor weather conditions, you're going to make uh, a much worse silage than a bad ryegrass silage when you when you go with these so you have to have a good wilt. Yeah, I, I think you probably have a narrower window window in the year mark where you can actually successfully make silage if you have a lot of chicory and plantain in your in your sword in particular. Um, uh, we we made we've made good and bad silage I suppose on the platform. Um, uh, the good silage uh, when we our first cut in 2020 across the system was, was good quality silage and the animals performed about 200 grams per day extra in their first winter uh, indoors on the multi-species silage compared to the um, perennial ryegrass silage. We are we do have another piece of work of another PhD student, Jonathan Higgins, who's looking at a um, multi-species swords, but with a specific silage mixture in that system. So the animals have multi-species grazing for the majority of the year, and the silage swords are a, a ryegrass uh, red clover mix. So there, there are ways around that challenge as well. There's a, a question here in relation to the its potential in organic farming uh, relative to, uh, I suppose, traditional mix our, our, our mixes uh, with with zero nitrogen effectively um well i guess a number of the slides that i showed there earlier on did show that a, a lot of our mixes that we had trial germ smart smart grass were performing well even under zero end conditions so i guess it's down to individuals then to decide you know, they want to farm in that way. And, and that's, um, you know, that, that, that these mixes can perform well under those conditions. Um, but how far you want to push them then is, is a decision that you, each individual has to take. A lot of the discussion so far has about been about reduced nitrogen, but uh, has there been any work being done on the, the, the indices of, of phosphorus required to grow these uh, 
these species or is there any difference at all between and, and traditional uh, ryegrass swords? It's it's not something we've investigated yet, Mark, and we've kept P and K non-limiting in all our in all our studies to date. I think you know, particularly at the reseeding stage, phosphorus is so important for seedling germination that you, you it'd be hard to construct an argument immediately to, to, to reduce that. But again, it's just it's another one of these questions that that needs that need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. How are we doing there, Pat? Yeah, uh, I suppose there's a, a, a number of questions in relation to habitats and, and uh, biodiversity, whether there is a, a, an improvement in uh, biodiversity outcomes as a result of, of multi-species. Um, I suppose that's to you, Helen, that's your area of expertise. <laughs> um, OK, so I put up the, some of the results we had generated from the earthworm studies, but we did actually measure uh, other components of bi invertebrate biodiversity within the Smartgrass project. And certainly there seemed to be a positive response in terms of overall invertebrate abundance, but also uh, abundance and diversity of beetles and also abundance of parasitic hymenoptera. Now we haven't gone, there could be responses elsewhere, but that, those were the ones that we've looked at to date. But we do hope to expand on that work in future projects um, so that we can, you know, get a better grasp. I mean, there's certainly never going to be a replacement for your uh, permanent semi-natural grassland and, and in terms of the biodiversity they can support. But what the data so far seems to be telling us is that they uh, enhance the invertebrate diversity in comparison to a ryegrass monoculture. Okay. Uh, there's a question there uh, relating to, is there a complete stop of, of uh, nitrogen applications uh, during the summer period or what time do you actually uh, cut the, the, the nitrogen out of the system? Yeah, so we were front loading our nitrogen input into those systems. So trying to uh, stop it, I guess, when legumes really kick in. So uh, I guess our cutoff period would generally be around the early May. We've been trying to get uh, completely stop it from there on. Okay. A uh, question in relation to animal health. Uh, is there, has there been any issues with bloat or uh, any other negative effects on, on, on animal health? Not in our beef or our, our, our sheep grazing studies to date, Pat, we've, we've seen put any in, in, indices of animal health. Uh, we've measured it's been, it's been positive. Uh, there were some bloat issues on the zero grazing trial um, with the dairy cows, but that was across the ryegrass and the ryegrass white clover and the multi-species swords, just the same. Obviously, with any, particularly in a dairy scenario where your cows have been turned out to the paddock after coming out of the milk parlor, in any situation where you have high levels of legume in a sward, you do need to be conscious of your management to, to minimize the risk of load. So maybe putting up an initial hot wire to, to, to restrict their area for, for an hour or two after turnout or uh, bloat oil in the water or something like that. But we, we haven't experienced any problems um, per se in, in our grazing scenarios to date. We're coming towards the end, I suppose. A nice, simple question for, for you. Is this the future of grassland farming? Well, I'll, I'll jump in first there maybe and, and Helen can, can come in afterwards. Uh, I think it's I think we've seen really positive results, Pat, of, of the benefits of multi-species sports today, but we need to be conscious of the potential for impact and infiltration at, at energy level. Um, you know, a very small percentage of our grassland is receded every year. Um, probably a lot of that grassland is in a receding cycle. So it's the same grassland being receded time and time again over the course of 10, 20 years. And those seed sales are dominated by perennial ryegrass seed at the moment, accounting for 95% plus of our seed sales. So is it the future of grassland? I don't think it's going to be a light switch moment, um, but I do think it's going to be, you know, a, one of a, a, of a range of options that are available to farmers. And, uh, you know, the, the, the island performance benefits from my perspective are clear and, and overcoming some of the persistency and establishment challenges will make it a more attractive tool at farm level. Well, it's just to, uh, to agree with all of what Tommy has said, and just to say that I, I think they're really only, you know, suitable for, for sowing into swords in areas where you would be 
uh, sowing in rye grass anyhow. The, the, these are not kind of, um, I, I personally would not like to see permanent grasslands being ploughed up to put these in, you know. Um, I think it, it's, it's, it's in areas where you're going to be doing the reseeding anyhow and where you have already modified the grassland to such a degree, um, I think are the only areas where these should really be considered. Uh, a question there in relation to, we, I suppose we have a number of zero grazing systems and farmers who particularly who are, who have uh, issues with, with uh, dispersed land. Uh, a lot of your trials has been done on, on a kind of a cut basis that are the early trials. Do you see a potential role for this uh, for uh, farmers who, are, who have zero grazing systems? Yeah, potentially I could see I could see it working there, Pat. And you know, the data from, from Helen's work in, in, in smart grass showed that they do persist better under cutting regimes compared to compared to grazing regimes. And then it, it it's all about what species farmers want to include in their mix to to you know, I suppose optimize their animal performance thereafter. Okay, um, we have come to the end of our, our slot here today. Uh, Tommy and Helen, thank you so much for your presentations and uh, your, your presentations will be available on the Chagas website afterwards and a recording of today's webinar. And uh, I just want to take this opportunity to thank uh, our production team, Andy Boland and Yvonne Maher and Pat Murphy, um, and uh, to thank the audience for sticking with us throughout the year. It's been a, a, a strange year for everybody, uh, but we do hope that the this series has, uh, I suppose, given people some some level of an anchor throughout the, 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 this, this strange time. Uh, before we leave you, I just want to share some details with you of an event that's taking place next week. It's a, being organized by the Climate Change Commission in New Zealand, and they've got in touch with us just to, to ask us to maybe to, to let you know about this event. It's a webinar taking place uh, next Thursday at 8 a.m. Uh, Irish time, so it's, it's uh, evening time over New Zealand, and it's with uh, Professor Frank Convery from the UCD Earth Institute, and they'll be talking uh, uh, about low emissions, uh, future, and the similarities between Ireland and New Zealand uh, on leading the climate uh, way towards uh, climate action. So uh, I do encourage you to, to check that out. Um, if you just Google Climate Change Commission, uh, the, uh, the details will be available there. So uh, to say thank you again, Tommy and Helen and Pat for helping with questions today. And we'll be back uh, next week at the normal time on Friday at 9.30. So we look forward to seeing you next week. Okay, we'll talk to you then. Bye-bye.